Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Starr, and I am with the Stanley Premium Western Forage Marketing Team. At Stanley, the health and well-being of the animals we serve is a priority by delivering the best nutrition and comfort through the highest quality forage. We are located in southern Idaho with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We are very excited to offer this educational webinar titled, Should I Be Concerned About Feeding Alfalfa? Facts and Misconceptions. Alfalfa has been a long time concern leaving horse owners with many questions, including to feed or not to feed alfalfa. Today we're going to learn some facts about the benefits of feeding alfalfa to your horses and get some answers to those dreaded myths you've heard time and time again. First, if you're new to joining our webinars, We'll take just a minute to go over a few items so you are comfortable with viewing and participating in our webinar. As a heads up, we will have a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar that we will pause the presentation for you to answer. We will also be giving away some free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so you're definitely going to want to stay with us till the end. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Clicking on the red box with the white arrow allows you to open and close the control panel anytime you'd like during the presentation. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will also have an opportunity to submit questions via text to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Depending on how many questions that come in, we may not be able to address all of them within our time frame but we will certainly use them for future nutritional pieces and connect with you one-on-one -on -one if you reach out to us. We have also attached a nutritional paper associated with today's webinar that you can download from the control panel under handouts. For those viewing this as a recording, go to stanleyforage.com under nutrition and nutritional resources to find the handout titled Alfalfa in Horses. This is a great take-home piece for today's webinar. And that's all I have from an introductory standpoint. So please welcome Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who serves as one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage equine nutritionists. She has a PhD in equine nutrition and reproduction. And with that, I will go ahead and let Dr. Cubitt share a little more about herself before she begins the presentation. Thank you, Katie, and again, thank you to everybody that signed on to listen to this webinar. I think it's a great way for us to share information and for you to find out a little bit more. So a little bit about myself. You may notice that I have a bit of an accent. I'm originally from Australia. I moved over here in 2001 to do a master's and PhD in equine nutrition at Virginia Tech, and now, as Katie mentioned, I work with performance horse nutrition we are an independent consulting company that works all around the world, and we're fortunate to partner with fantastic folks like Stanley Premium Western Forage. So with that, I will get started because I know we don't have all night. So, so we're going to start out with some of the history. In order to understand these myths, we also need to understand some of the, the history, facts, and benefits to alfalfa. We'll touch on those myths and we'll only touch on a few of them. I know there are a lot of myths surrounding alfalfa. Uh, please feel free to type in your questions at the end. Um, touch on a, a, a unique diet that I think you'll be quite surprised at what we can do if you had really good quality forage, i.e. alfalfa, in the horse's diet, and then obviously questions. Let's start out with the history of alfalfa. It's really quite unique. Um, alfalfa is scientific name is Medicago sativa. It was introduced into the U.S. in 1736, but it's actually one of the oldest cultivated crops and was got, grown in uh, the Mideast many, many years before that. It's very rich in protein, and we'll talk about 
the, what that protein is. Not all protein is the same. And it's high in vitamins and minerals as well. Alfalfa, when it's grown uh, under good conditions, also has a very high yield. So with a plant that's very high yielding, the producer doesn't have to put as much labor and energy into that plant, i.e. that's better for the environment, um, to get a higher yield. When you think about who consumes alfalfa the most, well, the dairy industry really consumes the most alfalfa, with about 60% going to the dairy industry. Uh, then our li other livestock animals, our meat animals, our beef cattle, sheep, goats, they're about 25%, and horses only about 15% of the market of alfalfa goes to horses. Let's touch on some of the facts of surrounding alfalfa. Alfalfa is a legume. It grows about three foot high and it has compound leaves. If you think about a blade of grass, that's a single leaf. But if you think about clover or a legume, they have multiple leaves on the one stem. That's a compound leaf. The stems grow from buds on the crown or the base. And you think crown being at the top, but it's really down here at the base is where, the where all the growth occurs. In some plants, the growth occurs up here in the top but in alfalfa, all the growth occurs down here near the root base. This is really quite interesting. Uh, when you think about the root system of alfalfa, it can, under favorable conditions, grow to about 25 or 30 feet down into the soil. So if you look at this graphic on the right-hand side, and you look at a pea plant, for example, quite shallow roots, corn, even potatoes have a shallow root system, wheat, uh, different varieties of wheat, but then alfalfa, much, much longer root system. In grasses, what we say is what you see above is what you see below. That is not the case with this legume, obviously. Um, if that was the case, we'd only have three feet of growth below. So uh, that actually is very important for the environment as well, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, we'll start at the bottom here, improves soil tilt. This is one of the environmental benefits to alfalfa. And what that means is with that root base going so deep into the soil, it can help stop compaction, soil compaction. So we know that tilling the soil isn't great. It um, unearths weed seeds. It kills off good bacteria that are in the soil, but if the soil is very compacted, sometimes we need to till it. But if you grow a crop like alfalfa with that really strong deep root base, then that can avoid some of this mechanized tilling. Other practices um, include growing a certain type of radish that has a very big tap root. So this, this is just one of the environmental benefits to alfalfa because I know it gets a little bit of a bad rap sometimes. Also beneficial to insects and wildlife. Um, the flowers on alfalfa are used for pollination. Uh, bees, the honey, American honeybee really uh, is attracted to the clover flat, the alfalfa flower. And then this nitrogen fixation, and you can see from this graphic here on the bottom left, there are nodes, these bacterial nodes that grow on the root system of the alfalfa. And what they do is put nitrogen back into the soil. That means that you don't need to put as much fertilization on the soil because nitrogen is the primary fertilization that we put on. But for, you know, at any good, um, farming cropping operation, they will rotate their crops. So one year we grow alfalfa in that same field, you may grow corn or, or some other crop. Alfalfa is going to fix nitrogen into the soil, it's going to put fertilization into the soil, so there's less um, synthetic fertilizers, there's less energy used when we're driving equipment um, to put that fertilizer out. So all around, Alfalfa has some really important environmental benefits as well as the benefits to the horse. If we look at a typical alfalfa forage, it's high in protein. We'll again, we will get to the type of protein that is contained in alfalfa. It's high in energy. Alfalfa has more calories than grass hays. 
you think about calories or energy, the way I like to describe it is energy is like body weight. And body weight, we think we measure body weight in pounds, we measure energy in calories. So calories and pounds go with body weight and energy. That's a little side note because sometimes people get a little um, unsure when I use the word energy or calories. So there's more energy in alfalfa than grass hay. So there's more calcium, which is very beneficial with some disorders that we'll look at. Moderate phosphorus and fiber, i.e. it's quite digestible. Very low starch, very low sugars. Um, and this relative feed value or va relative feed quality, alfalfa is very high, but as we get along, we will note that we don't necessarily use these terms readily in horses. Relative feed value and relative feed quality, relative feed quality or RFQ is actually the more preferred um, value. These were designed primarily for alfalfa. Sometimes people use them for other grasses, as you can see here, but they were primarily designed for alfalfa, but really they're used in the dairy cow industry or the livestock industry, and we really don't use these values for horses. But if you see this value, the higher the number, the more feed value, which in a dairy industry, you really want a very high value, whether that be 225 for relative feed quality or 160 for relative feed value. That may not be ideal for your horse, though. That may just be a little too rich. So in my opinion, disregard these values. I really, before we get too much more into um, the growing of alfalfa and carbohydrates and that kind of thing, it's a topic that I like to address when I discuss forages that are scientifically grown by Stanley Premium Western Forage. When I describe this company and the types of forages that they grow to other consumers, consumers to me, this is where growing forage and science culminate. They don't just grow grass or grow alfalfa and bale it. They take this to the next level. In Idaho, where this company is based, it is the most perfect conditions for growing forages. It really doesn't rain a lot, so we have the luxury of irrigating. We irrigate exactly when that plant needs it and exactly how much that plant needs. The air temperature and humidity is very low, so we have a decreased risk for pests and funguses. So that's a reduced risk, for, a reduced need for having to use herbicides or pesticides because we have a real reduced risk of those uh, occurring. Um, when we look at alfalfa, and we'll talk about some of the problems with alfalfa, if it's not dried properly or if it's over dried when it's baled, you'll see what we call leaf shatter. All the leaves will fall off. And that occurs in climates where you just can't control the temperature or the humidity. But fortunately, in Idaho, they, as I've mentioned, have ideal growing conditions. We really don't see these issues with leaf shatter because they can cut that hay, get it baled very quickly. It doesn't over mature. They also do routine soil samples. So they're only putting the exact fertilizer on those fields that those foragers need. So again, we're conscious of the environment. We're not over fertilizing and we're not under fertilizing. They also harvest ex at exactly the right uh, plant maturity. So I, I really like to point out that this is one of the benefits to Stanley Premium Western Forage, um, is they really take science into account when they grow these forages. So what are some of the actual other benefits to alfalfa? At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Katie to start with our first poll question. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. And our first poll question is actually going to be a fill in the blank. So alfalfa blank ulcers. And your options are alfalfa inflames ulcers or alfalfa minimizes ulcers. Please select the appropriate response and click submit. And don't worry if you're a little unsure of the answer, just provide your best guess. 
Your specific answer won't be seen by any other attendees, but we will view the total responses together once the poll is closed. Okay, it looks like about 75% of you have voted. I'll give you just a few more moments to finish up before we close the poll. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now and I will share it with the attendees. So, Dr. Cubit, we have 87% said that alfalfa minimizes ulcers and 13% says that it inflames ulcers. So I will now go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Cubit to address the poll. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. It, it seems we have a very well-read audience, which is excellent. Um, absolutely, alfalfa is beneficial for the reduction in incidence of ulcers, and we'll talk about that a little in the next couple of slides. But what I first want to point out um, are some of the benefits of alfalfa. Let's go back to what horses are designed to do. Horses are designed to eat large quantities of forage and continually. They're really not designed to eat large amounts of grain. That being said, we expect horses to do a lot more than what they would have done in the wild. They live till they're about 30. They're carrying us around. They're jumping, doing dressage, whatever discipline you're involved in. So the exercise output from these animals is much higher. Therefore, their caloric intake is much higher. So instead of adding a lot of extra grain to the diet to meet the calorie requirements of these exercising horses, alfalfa can be an excellent addition to your feeding program to give the horse calorie sources in a form that they are designed to consume them. They're designed to consume large quantities of forage. So the caloric content of alfalfa is a benefit. Protein. Pro yes, alfalfa has a lot of protein in it, but it's very good quality protein. And when I say that, I mean it's high in essential amino acids like lysine. Lysine is what we call the first limiting amino acid. It is the single most important amino acid for growing horses and broodmares. As you can see from our little diagram here on the bottom, lysine, the amount of lysine in the diet, dictates the use of every other amino acid. So you can see on this barrel example here, we've got one of these whiskey barrels and every wooden slat represents a different amino acid and the amino acid lysine here, that slat is only coming halfway up the barrel. So how much water or whiskey or whatever you like to drink can you put in the barrel? Only half full. So all of this up here, all of this methionine and leucine and isoleucine, valine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, threonine, all of these other amino acids that are also important to the horse cannot be used. They can only be used up to the amount of lysine. So if you increase the amount of lysine in the diet by adding ingredients high in it, like alfalfa or soybean meal, then you are going to further increase the use of these other amino acids. And amino acids in the body are used for just about everything. So the protein, when we talk about the myths, we will talk about how protein in particular is the root of a lot of these myths and they're all really quite incorrect. So let's touch on those ulcers that are the benefit from the alfalfa. About 90% of performance horses have gastric ulcers, about 60% have colonic ulcers, and about half the population have them in both sections of the gastrointestinal tract. What's causing these gastro gastric ulcers? Well, fasting, meal feeding. Um, at no point in the wild does the horse look at the sun and just say, well, it's 7 o'clock in the morning, I can eat. They are designed to constantly be consuming a small amount of forage trickling through the digestive system. So these feeding of large meals is very foreign and it's not how the digestive system is designed to function. High grain diets, when we have a race horse or a three day event horse or anything that needs to get a lot of extra calories for body weight maintenance, we tend to go straight towards a higher grain diet. That's not ideal for the horse. It increases the acidity of the gut. A lot of this type of horses, race horse, do not get enough roughage in their diet. They're stressed from transport, stabling, exercise, as well as long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like bute can actually wear away 
it's a mucus coating in the bottom of the stomach that's protecting that tissue from the acid. What will you notice in your horse? Um, well, you may see some acute or recurrent colic-like symptoms if the ulcers are quite bad. What you'll mostly notice at first is maybe they start to get a little picky either. Um, weight loss, hair coat changes, behavior is one of the very first things that you will notice. Um, a lot of people will say, I think my horse needs a calming supplement. When they describe the types of behaviors, I associate that to a pain response and a change in behavior and not necessarily actually a, a, a behavioral change. Uh, poor performance, chronic diarrhea, teeth grinding or jaw clenching. They don't like the bit in their mouth. Some might say, oh, well, it's a muscle issue in their jaw. No, when I'm in pain, I clench my jaw. Um, pain and distress when you tighten the girth, for example, or if you have a harness horse when you put the harness on them. Why is alfalfa a good solution? Alfalfa hay, the research has been done at uh, Texas A&M University by several researchers. Alfalfa is high in calcium. That is a natural buffer to the acidity in the stomach. Um, when they looked at feeding young horses either alfalfa or Bermuda grass hay and looked at the incidence of it's being able to decrease the incidence of ulcers and severity, when they were feeding alfalfa compared to Bermuda grass hay, the incidence of those ulcers really significantly decreased as well as the severity. Um, also when you're chewing forage you can produce saliva which is also another buffer to the stomach. So alfalfa hay, long stem hay would be most ideal but pellets or cubes for a lot of us in the regions of the countries that we live in is more convenient um, so that's fine too. We recommend prior to exercise a couple of handfuls of alfalfa pellets or cubes. Or after your nighttime, after your last feed of the night, um, add a bucket of alfalfa pellets or cubes wet to the stall so that they can just chew away on that. So let's go, get into the meat of this webinar, these myths. Um, is it high in carbs? Does it have too much energy? Will it cause growth issues in my horse? Will my horse colic or get bloated if they eat it? I've heard it causes kidney damage. Others say, my horse coughed a lot. So next poll question, over to you, Katie. Thank you. So our next polling question is, what is your biggest myth concern from the questions that Dr. Hubert just mentioned? The options are alfalfa is high in carbs, alfalfa will make my horse hot, alfalfa will cause my horse to bloat or colic, or alfalfa will give my horse kidney damage. Please go ahead and select the appropriate response and click submit. Okay, it looks like we have about 75% who have responded. Uh, please go ahead and respond and we will close the poll in just a few moments. Okay, we will go ahead and close the poll now. So, I'd like to share it with everyone. We have 25% of attendees, um, their biggest concern is alfalfa is high in carbs. 40% have a, the biggest concern of alfalfa will make my horse hot. 7% are concerned that it will cause their horse to bloat or colic. And 28% will give their horse kidney damage. Dr. Cubitt, I will go ahead and let you um, continue with the presentation. Excellent. And we'll address all of those as we move forward with the myths. But I want to start out with, is it high in carbohydrates? Let's break down carbohydrates. So we have sugars, simple sugars, water-soluble carbohydrates, and fructan. That is how our cool season grasses store their energy. Legumes and cereal grains store their energy as starch. So alfalfa, being a legume, does not store its energy as sugars or fructan. Now, we also call legumes, like alfalfa, self-limiting in their ability to store starch. That means, think about it like the gas tank of a car. There is, when the sun is shining, I think we'll go here to the next slide, 
if we go back to photosynthesis or high school biochemistry, when the sun is shining on the plant, it accumulates, photosynthesis occurs, and it will accumulate its energy storage in grasses, that sugars, in alfalfa, that starch. But as I mentioned, alfalfa is self-limiting. So there's only a certain amount of starch that that alfalfa can store per day. And once it's filled up that space, it can't store anymore until it utilizes that starch for energy, i.e. for growth. Grasses, on the other hand, they don't have, they're not self-limiting. They will continue to store energy as long as the, the sun is shining. So plant growth. What's going to cause a plant to grow at night and utilize that energy? Well, if the soil's got enough moisture, if the temperature is correct in the base of the roots as well as the air temperature, if there's enough fertilization in the soil and if the daylight is correct, i.e. we've got low daylight because plants grow at night. So, plants that aren't growing very fast, they're very high in non-structural carbohydrates. Plants that grow rapidly are low in non-structural carbohydrates because they're utilizing that energy. So the fact that our Stanley can use uh, adequate fertilizer, adequate um, water, these plants grow quickly. So they're low in non-structural carbohydrates. Combine that with the fact that alfalfa, just by nature, does not store much starch, then alfalfa is low in sugars and starches in non-structural carbohydrates makes it ideal for um, horses with metabolic syndrome. So if you look at your typical grass hays, they can run up around at high 18% sugars and starches. Alfalfa hay at best is going to run around 13 and grass pastures also up around 18%. So um, alfalfa is low in non-structural carbohydrates. Will alfalfa make my horse hot? Too much energy, fizzy behavior. Now, a lot of this tends to come from people assuming that too much protein in the diet will cause their horse to be hot. So I don't want to say that feeding alfalfa to your horse will not make him have a little bit of a um, hyper behavior, but it is not coming from the protein. Alfalfa does provide a significant amount of calories. However, excess calories in any form, whether from alfalfa, grain, or oil, without the exercise to burn them, can result in, ex in an excessively energetic horse. Now, grains obviously have got high in non-structural carbohydrates, so they change behavior as well. But your alfalfa being your fibrous carbohydrates and your oil, um, they're not going to cause the horse to have a, a, a big shift in behavior. But as I mentioned, if there's excess energy, it will either get used to make the horse fat or change behavior. Protein is not an efficient energy source. The, what, the primary time when the body is going to use protein for energy is when it's used up in a starvation state. It's used up all of the glucose in the muscles, it's used up all of the fat, and now it starts to break down the amino acids, the protein in the muscles, and it goes into a catabolic state. Will alfalfa cause growth issues for my young horse? So when we think about growth issues, one of the first things we think about is physitis. We've got this swelling at the growth plate. Excess protein has often been implicated but never supported by research. There is no research out there that says that excess protein causes growth disorders in growing horses. A high protein diet does not make a foal grow faster, but more so than a diet that just meets the NRC requirements. There is no effect of increasing protein on the incidence of DOD, and that has been supported several times. No one has been able to support it causing these growth issues. On the flip side though, low protein or low quality protein does actually impair growth and could lead to DOD. So you may actually be causing it if you remove all of the protein from the diet or at least try and restrict it. 
especially if you're restricting quality of protein. Alfalfa is ideal for young growing horses and brood mares. Does it cause bloat or colic? Well, you know, I could say, well, this is a plausible concern. If you change anything in your horse's diet rapidly, you will cause colic. Whether you change the grain, the hay, the alfalfa, you can cause colic. Alfalfa can cause bloat in cattle due to the layout of their intestinal tract, but that's because in cattle, all of those microorganisms are in the foregut or the stomach, the rumen, and if they produce excess gas, there's nowhere for it to go other than for the animal to belch. But in horses, all because of their intestinal layout, all of those bacteria are in the hindgut of the horse, that gas is easily excreted. So it does not cause bloat in horses. Does it cause kidney damage? This is one that I hear a lot um, from people that are feeding primarily alfalfa and they're concerned about issues with the kidney. Normal healthy horses can metabolize and excrete extra protein in alfalfa hay without damaging their kidneys. Horses that are on higher protein diets will drink more because it helps them filter that excess protein out of the kidneys. So as long as your horse is drinking and urinating normally and the urine doesn't have a really strong excessive smell, then everything is good. Will it make my horse cough? This isn't one of the more common myths, but it's something that I hear a little, um, that some horses tend to cough more when fed alfalfa. Really, this is due to irritants like dust or mold, and it's not the alfalfa itself. Um, alfalfa can be dustier than grass hay if it's baled or cut under poor conditions, i.e. the moisture conditions that at baling weren't ideal, therefore we get that increased leaf shatter. But Stanley has strict protocols for cutting up to avoid that leaf shatter, and their products are exceptionally clean. Mold on any hay, be it grass or alfalfa, will cause respiratory irritants to horses. Very quickly, I want to just give you this ideal, this diet here. So recently I was asked to give a presentation on feeding um, forage to horses and in my opinion we don't feed enough forage to horses. And there was a study out of Europe actually looking at these standard bred horses that were fed um, through growth and training and breaking and training and now even into competition. Um, they were fed a high forage diet. Now they were feeding a silage based diet, but I wanted to replicate that with alfalfa. So a horse at 1100 pounds at intense exercise, if you're feeding them a really premium quality alfalfa at about 22 pounds a day, adding a ration balancer pellet at around two and a half pounds and some oil, we are going to have an ideal diet. You can see down the bottom here, energy, protein, calcium, phosphorus, etc. They are all of the critical nutrients and then up on the vertical axis here we have the requirements. So the goal with this chart is that all of the bars touch this red line and when they do that the diet is balanced. So what I want to point out here is that you can adequately balance a intensely exercising horse's diet with good quality alfalfa fed in enough quantity and a ration balancer pellet, totally reducing the amount of starch, which may be increasing our risk for gastrointestinal upset and gastric ulcers. When not to use alfalfa, very briefly, I wanted to touch on this because there are some times when it's not ideal. If your horse is too fat, it's overweight, it's, it's obese, then it doesn't need extra calories. So the extra energy or calories in alfalfa is not ideal. So try a Timothy grass product. Uh, Stanley also has very good quality Timothy grass products. If your horse has the genetic condition, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis or HYPP, where they really need a low potassium diet, alfalfa is high in potassium, as is orchard grass. So we want to avoid those. And again, go with that Timothy grass product. The other two issues would be if your horse has kidney dysfunction from um, an injury, uh, an, a 
acute dehydration. There are a number of reasons why a horse's kidneys may fail. Now, a horse with a healthy kidney, everything is fine. You don't need to be concerned about feeding alfalfa. But if the horse is diagnosed with kidney dysfunction, we need a low protein diet. So your orchard grass or Timothy grass products are ideal. If your horse has liver dysfunction, it comes down to the types of amino acids. So alfalfa has what we call aromatic amino acids, or they're circular, and we want to decrease those in a horse with liver dysfunction. So again, try your orchard grass, Timothy grass products, or beet pulp is ideal for horses with liver dysfunction, but avoid your alfalfa-based products. So with that, I know we've run over by about five minutes, but I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt, for some great insight into alfalfa benefits and misconceptions. Just a reminder to download the nutritional paper under handouts before we end the webinar. We'll be drawing our winner for free product coupons following this Q&A session, so please um, stick around for that. Oh, so as as Dr. Cubitt just mentioned, let's go ahead and get started on a few questions that were submitted during today's presentation. Again, please feel free to still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel if you would like. Dr. Cubitt, our first question is from Noelle, and she asked, what is an ETEC balancer? Sorry, the ETEC, that was a product name. It's a ration balancer. Most of your um, companies, your Purina, Neutrina, whatever your local company is, will have a ration balancer. That was a product from another client of mine, um, and that was their brand. But a balancer, a ration balancer pellet is a low intake vitamin mineral pellet that's going to give you good quality protein plus vitamins and minerals and it's ideal to balance that alfalfa. Perfect. And our next question is from Elise, I think is what your name is. Um, please forgive me if I mispronounce that. But her question is, can alfalfa contribute to development of insulin resistance? Along those lines, what about feeding any alfalfa to an insulin resistant horse? Um, this is an interesting question because there are a group of people that are suggesting that high-protein diets may increase um, or exacerbate insulin resistance, certainly not cause insulin resistance. The typical insulin-resistant horse is overweight, so don't feed it alfalfa. But if you have that category of metabolic syndrome horses that are underweight and need extra calories, I still recommend feeding alfalfa um, because it's low in non-structural carbohydrates and maybe mix it with a, um, a, a, also a low-carb hay. So I don't think that it, in, in my opinion, in my scientific opinion, I don't think it increased inc the incidence of insulin resistance, but I understand where some people are getting that notion from because I know there's a group that are kind of petitioning for that. but Obese horse, don't feed it alfalfa. Needs weight, I still think alfalfa is a good idea. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. Our next question is from Joe. Does alfalfa contribute to tying up? Excellent. Another great question. Um, and from the standpoint of the sugars and starches, absolutely not. From the standpoint of protein, absolutely not. Protein has no role in muscle disorders in tying up. Great. And Sandra has a question. Does the high calcium in alfalfa cause bone problems? No. The, the high calcium in alfalfa does not cause bone problems as long as you're making sure you've got adequate phosphorus in supply. In mature horses, we can go as high as 5 to 1 on the ratio of calcium to phosphorus without having any issues. Um, oftentimes on the West Coast, you may find feed companies that will design feeds that are um, meant to be fed with alfalfa, so they'll have slightly less protein and slightly less calcium to accommodate that or complement the alfalfa. 
But as long as you're feeding adequate amounts of phosphorus um, and we don't get more than 6 to 1 ratio there of, of, of calcium to phosphorus, then we're fine. If you limit the amount of calcium and you have more phosphorus, then obviously, yes, you will have um, bone problems. Perfect. And Jenny would like to know, is alfalfa ideal for a horse with Cushing's? Um, again, an excellent question. It all depends. A typical Cushing's horse is lose, losing weight and losing top line. So if we want to help with weight maintenance and some of that top line, um, then alfalfa would be ideal. If it's an obese um, horse with Cushing's, then again, no, don't feed it. Okay. Kimberly would like to know, if you notice a horse on alfalfa on 30 days for ulcer treatment is now having a wetter stall, would you cut back? Um, no, I wouldn't cut back because all they're doing is, you know, you're feeding a lot of the alfalfa for the calcium, for the ulcer benefits, the energy, etc. If they're not needing all the extra protein that they're getting out of it, then what it means that the horse's stall is wetter, it just means they're really good at excreting it. Their kidneys are functioning well. Um, so, no, I, I don't think it's a problem. Okay. And um, this is a little bit of a specific question, and I know we've talked about Cushing's, but Janet would like to know, I have a 32-year-old Arab mare that has Cushing's and EMS. My nutritionist has put my horse on Timothy and not alfalfa along with a ration balancer. So this comes back to I'm not um, privy to the body condition score of your horse. Um, as long as that Timothy is low in non-structural carbohydrates, which you know, I'm sure you've maybe had it tested or you're soaking it, then that is a fine diet. If you want to add a little calories because you want some weight maintenance um, or some extra top line because uh, typically these Cushing's horses will lose it, um, then add, add some alfalfa. But you mentioned the horse has equine metabolic syndrome, so if he's overweight or has those random fat pads, then perhaps uh, alfalfa would not be ideal. All comes down to body condition when we're dealing with equine metabolic syndrome or PPID, otherwise known as Cushing's. Okay, and Alethea would like to know, how about enterolifts? Mm, ew, great question. So, enterolifts are these stones, um, they're developed in the gastrointestinal tract, and it starts with a foreign body, a stick, a stone a piece of um, baling twine, something foreign. And then we get these mineral buildups around that foreign body that can grow and grow and grow and cause these large stones. Now, I've seen horses get enteroliths and they've never eaten alfalfa in their life. Um, and we look at the water quality. Some water is very high in mineral content. Um, I had a friend in Australia, her stallion was imported from Germany and eventually he had to be put down because he had terrible colic and he had a massive enterolith. But again, that horse had never had alfalfa. He'd eaten a lot of fermented forage products. Um, so if your horse is consuming plenty of water, um, then I am not concerned about enteroliths. If you know that your water is very high in mineral content, then you may want to get your water um, checked out before, uh, before you're concerned about alfalfa. So if you've got a high mineral area, maybe add, maybe mix your alfalfa with grass hay. Um, but there are plenty of horses out there that get enteroliths that have never touched alfalfa. Okay, and I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, so Denise would like to know, can alfalfa cause laminitis? Can alfalfa cause laminitis? Well, I would have to say, yes, it could. If your horse was fat and you gave it alfalfa and it got even fatter, then sure. 
Um, from the non-structural carbohydrate content, no, it's not high in non-structural carbohydrates. So feeding alfalfa will not cause um, laminitis like feeding too much grain to your horse. So again, comes down to if your horse is obese, don't feed it alfalfa because that will increase its obesity and therefore increase its risk for insulin resistance and laminitis and metabolic syndrome. But if your horse is not obese, then I see no problem with adding alfalfa to the diet. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. And thank, thank you. you everyone for attending today's webinar. We really appreciate your time and your interest in wanting to learn more about nutrition for your animals. Before we wrap up, we'll go ahead and announce our winner of free product coupons now. And the winner is Noel Sophie. Congratulations. We will email you to get mailing information to send out those coupons to you, Noel. Again, thank you everyone for joining. If you have any other questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, please contact Stanley's customer relations team. The phone number and email are available on this final slide. When you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and it would be very appreciated if you would complete that for us. Your feedback will really help us create better webinars for you and help us identify some great topics for future webinars we will host later this year and next year. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar if you'd like to go back and reference it. The recording should be available for a week following today's webinar and then available on our website under Nutritional Resources. On behalf of Stanley Premium Western Forage and Dr. Cubitt, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and we hope that you have a great rest of your week.